Today, we're getting into a really specific, uh, pretty fascinating mushroom variant, the Yeti. That's right. We've looked at the information on its mycology, where it came from, and, you know, what makes it look so distinct. And our goal here is really just to understand what makes Yeti stand out in its lineage, biologically speaking, its history, its specific features. So let's dig into this material and see what makes Yeti noteworthy for mycologists. Okay, so first off, Yeti is part of the true albino teacher lineage, the Tat lineage. And it's, well quite remarkable within that group. And the big thing right away is its size. It's known for having the largest fruiting body, really, in the entire Tat family tree. Yeah, that size is a huge marker. Its origin story is also really interesting. It involves the mycologist Jick Phibbs. What's quite cool about how it appeared is that unlike maybe a lot of strains people work with, Yeti wasn't something deliberately crossbred over and over. Precisely. Yeah, it actually started as a natural mutation. Just completely spontaneous. So it just showed up. Yeah, it popped up on some albino golden teacher fruiting bodies Jick Fibs was cultivating. And he noticed something different. He did. He saw these uh, kind of strange, really thick-stemmed mutations. The fruiting bodies were unusually large, very solid, and they just kept growing past the normal point. Wow. And that observation, that single find, was actually pretty instrumental, wasn't it? Hugely. It didn't just lead to Yeti itself but it helped define the whole true albino teacher category. You know, the family that includes Ghost, Jack Frost, and Yeti. And Jick Phibbs himself felt strongly about it. There's that quote mentioned in the sources from 2023. Oh yeah, it's quite powerful. Yeah. He said, if I were to die today, Yeti would be my proudest accomplishment. Really shows how significant he felt this natural variant was. And part of that significance comes from how it behaved genetically, right? After it appeared. Right, it stabilized uh, incredibly quickly. We're talking just a few generations. So it started breeding True, reliably, very fast. Exactly. It became this consistent, recognizable isolate with its distinct features showing up reliably. That natural stability, getting those reliable traits so fast from a spontaneous event, that makes it pretty rare, a really valuable find for the Tat family tree. Didn't need loads of work to get it consistent. Definitely. Now, moving beyond the origin, its actual appearance is pretty unmistakable. Oh, for sure. Those massive, thick stems really stand out and often paired with quite broad caps. Sometimes you even see a bit of a bluish tint along the stem. Yeah, that bluing can be there. The cap itself is usually off-white, maybe creamy. Sometimes it has this subtle kind of sheen to it. And the stem structure is notably thick, quite dense. Its growth cycle is a bit different, too, compared to some common ones. It is. It tends to be slower than, say, your standard golden teacher or B plus one. The information suggests its pace is more like penis envy, which is also known for being slower. And the name Yeti, does it actually need cold? Well, no, not specifically. It doesn't require cold temperatures to grow. But it is shown it can handle slightly cooler conditions better than some other strains. So it's got a certain hardiness. Okay, now here's a really interesting biological point, especially for researchers or anyone trying to preserve it. The spores. Ah, yes. This is key. Yeti has extremely low spore production, really minimal. So trying to make a traditional spore print, just letting the cap drop spores onto foil or paper, that often just doesn't work well. Pretty much ineffective, yeah. To get the genetics, you really need a different method. Researchers or collectors have to directly swab the gills. Just physically wiping the gills with a sterile swab. Exactly. That's how you pick up the few spores that are actually there. Which really underscores how important specific preservation techniques are for this one using sterile swabs, sealing them properly, keeping them airtight, cool, dark. Or maybe working with isolated spore syringes if you can get them. Without those careful steps because it barely drops spores, this unique line could potentially just fade away from collections and research over time. So when you look at all the Tate variants, Yeti really does carve out its own space. For sure. That massive size, the fact it came from a naturally stable mutation, its unique look, and especially this very unusual low spore production. It all makes it a standout subject for mycologists and collectors. Right. So just to quickly recap the main takeaways from this deep dive, we've seen the Yeti mushroom didn't come from deliberate crossing, but was a unique natural mutation found by Jick Fibs on albino golden teachers. We talked about its very distinct look, those big thick stems, the creamy caps, and noted its slower growth, but decent resilience in cooler temperatures. And maybe most critically for its study, that extremely low spore production means you can't just rely on spore prints. 
You need specific techniques like gill swabbing to preserve its genetics. Yeah, that's crucial. So for you, the listener, hopefully this gives you a deeper appreciation for the specific biology and history of this one particular mushroom variant, especially if you're curious about mycology.